Right, um, so uh, we began almost inevitably uh, before the tea break to drift into the area of what to do about some of the issues that were raised by the six uh, workshops. So my first uh, words are by way of apology if some of this uh, retreads some of the areas that we've already spoken about. Um, what I'd like to do uh, in the next 10 or 15 minutes is to go through the uh, six uh, workshops. There were something, depending on how you count them, there were something like 74 recommendations, um, hundreds of them of which asked for money from me. So, they're not. Um, there were 74 recommendations aimed at different parts of the sector um, and different uh, collaborations and different approaches to uh, resolution. Some of them are very long range and broad. Some of them are quite specific and tight. So what I've tried to do is take and digest them for you. I've only been partially successful not having four stomachs. So I can only manage to do um, a, a kind of high level presentation. Um, what I've tried to do in the, uh, uh, at the end of this presentation is to bring out uh, one or two high level recommendations which map neatly in part to uh, the high level uh, issues that were raised in Jan's paper. And throughout you will see little bits of green text which I hope will show up um, in this room. But those are the things that we think are already in train or are uh, well planned and will be in train soon. Um, what we'd like to do uh, after I've done my presentation is to then if you like, reflect on those with you and try and get from a sense uh, from you as to what the priorities for action should be. Um, it, uh, and we can either look at them, well, we, I think we'll probably look at them by theme, but that will be in the hands of your um, esteemed chair, Peter. So uh, the first one was managing the resource. Um, and we looked at uh, heritage legislation and policy uh, and the recommendations were really to monitor, evaluate and advocate, there's that word again, on the proposed changes. And some of the, the areas which are of deepest concern um, were around the reframing of the National Planning Policy Framework and the apparent diminution of uh, heritage interests within it and the permission in principle uh, um, approach to, if you like, having... Um, uh, pre-decided whether a, a development can go ahead without appropriate archaeological uh, coverage. Um, so that was one recommendation, and we're already looking at the implications of the NPPF as a sector uh, already, so we're trying to do that advocacy. It will remain to be seen as to how successful we'll be. Um, the other one was using the existing provisions better, and we heard a little bit about national importance um, uh, before the tea break. Um, and that's one example of where we might be able to use tools that already exist in the toolbox to make changes. Um, but of course we'd need to, to think very carefully about what that actually means in practice. And what I should say before I go on, because I work for Historic England, it's PERDA at the moment. So I can't announce anything uh, that we're signing up to in terms of policy changes without checking in with government. So you won't get any commitments from Historic England today as to what we're going to be doing. There's my need to get out of jail free card. Um, the next uh, element was to seek to integrate across the historic environment the, the, our approaches and beyond to the natural environment. Now, all those three, I would argue, are quite long range and quite uh, uh, complex uh, things to address. But the, 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 the benefits, the bonuses of getting that right would be substantial in terms of, of the underpinning infrastructure for uh, development-led archaeology in this country. The next, bit, the next area was in the scheduling, and uh, the, workshops wanted to, um, the workshop wanted to develop a clearer future strategy based both on priorities, what should we schedule next, and why, and also on the capacity to do so. So some kind of action plan about enhancing the scheduling approach was being proposed. Alongside that was the process of scheduling, and there was a plea for an action on engaging the public more in that process, making the whole uh, scheduling process much more transparent and publicly accountable even. 
In terms of national importance, um, the workshops uh, uh, drove us to, or, or exhorted us to develop a career strategy based on the pilot studies that we did now a couple of years ago, to be fair, um, and uh, look at the capacity to deliver and how to link that to uh, the footnote in the draft consultation on the MPPF. Um, that's a critically important one, and it's green because Historic England have got a commitment to do something with national importance. Part of what we do with it will actually come out of the work that's being done through these workshops and through the, what we hear t uh, today here. Um, so I can't give you any more detail, but that's definitely in plan. And then finally, a kind of soft one, which is, is uh, beneficial to all of us, and I think a, a genuinely good idea, um, share uh, space to share best, best practice and case studies. So this is, this is about the collaboration bit. This is how do we make that stick? How do we find a place to where we're not um, working on the different kind of tensions at work that we cover to, to stop, pause, think, share, and build something that's collaborative and creative? On the standards and guidance side of things, um, uh, we've heard from Jan the issue of the principles, definitions, and hierarchies. And what we were asked was, uh, could uh, we set overarching principles about guidance, uh, definitions? So this is about the hierarchy, the approach from the very high level, NPPF, if you like, kind of level of guidance, all the way down to technical advice notes on amino acid racemization or whatever it might be. Um, and explain how that uh, um, web of interlinked advice and support works for everybody. Um, and critically, and that, that was also mentioned, defining ownership and responsibility. So we have professional institutes, we have local authorities, we have charitable organisations, we have national agencies and so on, all of whom have skill sets and expertise that could contribute to this not all of whom necessarily know or agree whose role it is to produce what. And so getting rid of some of that would be very helpful in terms of clarifying uh, next stages. And those next stages might include um, uh, the standards and guidance landscape, as I've called it, um, mapping the current suite, undertaking the gaps analysis and effectiveness and enforceability assessments. Um, easy words to say, bloody hard to do. So we need to think, what, what does this sector, does the profession need? Because we don't want any more than we need. Building guidance just for the sake of it is pointless. So understanding where the real needs are and also how they bite, how they work, and how people can use them with confidence and uh, ensure that they're simple. And on that basis, we could commission or decommission guidance. There's no, nothing wrong with getting rid of old stuff that's just in the way or repurposing it, and there's every reason to think about uh, commissioning stuff that we do as a sector need. And we heard earlier, and we will see in the, in the recommendations for synthesis, the idea of the tension around standardisation versus the creativity and the innovation and the ability to act freely and be free of any kind of um, uh, uh, straitjacket. Um, visibility, access and uptake of standards and guidance is critical. It's all very well it being there, but if nobody knows that it's there at all or where to find it, that's a rather a problem. Um, so we need to promote better understanding through both training and CPD activities. I might suggest such as the CIFA conference, for example. Um, and uh, consider cross-sector um, regional hubs to break sector silos. Now this, I don't think, in this, in, in this workshop, I don't think the, the, the thinking was particularly well advanced, and that's the point of the workshop. The idea was to, to see whether or not all the sectoral interests, so from specialists to uh, uh, heritage managers, possibly even developers and their consultants and so on, are they all represented and in the same room? Do they share that understanding of what um, should be used? Compliance and enforcement, develop better enforcement and compliance mechanisms across the sector through systems, incentives and training. We've got some systems, they work patchily. We've got some training, it may be appropriate, it may not. But incentives is a really interesting thing. How do we celebrate success? Where does it work? Where can we see the, the case studies of it actually improving practice? 
Um, and that follows on to the addressing poor professional practice, which is understanding the root causes. Are people doing uh, uh, things in a slightly less advantageous or beneficial way because they're willfully doing it? Probably not. Is it because they don't understand what the requirements are? Quite, could quite well be. Um, or is it that, that we haven't quite shared the, the common vision properly? Um, and somewhere there also, there is the backup for training, um, the Registered Archaeological Organisation Scheme that CIFA run, um, and individual support in cases of bad practice was suggested. So, so is, there a, is there a support mechanism for people who feel that they might want some help? Does the sector kind of look after its people, as it were? Um, on new models for advisory services, uh, we were exhorted to clarify and articulate the relationship between Historic England and local authorities. We heard quite a lot about that earlier on, so I won't dwell on that. Some parts of that are in train, for sure. Some of it will come through Historic England's own change programme, but also we'll be uh, uh, considering how we reach out at a local level to engage with, um, with local authorities. And we're also doing some of the roles and responsibilities uh, uh, work in things like the Heritage Information Access Strategy, where we've got a really good working relationship, I would argue, with local authorities and with the National Agency to work on a joint issue. Um, clearly defining the roles of the local authority archaeology services and fully seeking full sector consensus on that. Again, small words, quite a lot of work to do. But uh, that's to, to, un to ensure that local authority services do have a sense of consistency for the customers, whether they be the sector or whether they be the developers and, and the, um, the users, as it were. Um, the status of services. Um, and again, Jan mentioned this this morning, uh, sorry, earlier on this afternoon, exploring statutory status for local authority heritage services um, and seeking a wider recognition. There's that advocacy issue again. Uh, explaining why these services are so damned important to uh, an, a, a proper um, functioning uh, archaeology process. Um, capacity and, uh, sorry, structure and funding. Um, this is an interesting one, exploring innovative service delivery models. Have we got a picture across the, the, the piece of where innovation is taking place in local, local authority service models? Can we learn from those? Can we pick the best practice out? and drop stuff that isn't working? Can we share those, perhaps in that space I mentioned earlier? Um, and potential funding streams for those local authority services. Is there some way of incentivizing the, um, the parent local authority to take care of those services because they are a, a, a good source of solid income in some way? Um, capacity and performance. Uh, I've put green there for continuing the annual surveys because Historic England are funding those and will continue to do so so that we can track the changes in local authority staffing provisions both for archaeology and for heritage services generally. But there's suggestions of extensions into the impact and performance of those local authority services and I think that's beginning to hint at the public value aspect of stuff. Does it work? Is it, is it producing what is needed? Possibly contentious. Um, and also evaluate the impact of areas where service has been lost. So that might be linked to the uh, innovation approach, but it's also being able to advocate what happens when it all goes wrong. Um, support and celebration. Uh, we mentioned that previous in, in the previous workshop. Um, create training and mentoring programs. There's the skills issue again and explore how to provide recognition and celebrate best practice in local authorities. So um, everybody's uh, uh, aware of how, how much under pressure local authority staff are. Is there some way of sharing um, when we recognize that things are going incredibly well? Then we move from the big uh, picture to the sort of archeological practice side of things, new narratives from synthesis. Uh, define synthesis was a call. What do we mean by that? Um, and it turned out that there are actually more, more uh, uh, answers to that than I thought. I, uh, I just didn't know why there were so many, but there, there is. Uh, I thought it was creating new knowledge from putting things together, but there we go. Um, encouraging further uh, period and thematic syntheses, and we spoke about that earlier. And that is something that Historic England is very keen to do. 
Um, and we're all ears open to all sorts of interesting ideas, and we are receiving them. Um, but it, it might also be an exhortation not just to historic England. It might be um, approaches to local authorities as well. And it could well be uh, driven from the academic sector aiming at research councils or some other sources of funding. So the sector as a whole could encourage the, um, the, uh, uh, the participation of all of its uh, relevant components in doing that. Strategic approaches to large-scale developments. Um, this is really interesting. It's not, not so much about the, the High Speed 2 or the A14 or whatever it might be, but more about is there a way of thinking innovatively, and, and Sandy began to hint at <coughs> part of that, innovatively about the approach to numerous developments within a single area. I'm not going as far as suggesting a levy or a development tax for the funding, and we'll come on to that, but is there a way of drawing those bits of pieces of the puzzle together in a strategic way given the uh, requirements of the planning process and the requirements of being able to schedule staff and, and carry on the daily work as it were. Um, and I think that the, the, qu the, the request there was to sort of uh, look at how we might do that and, and explore some ideas. Standardised fieldwork approaches, uh, I mentioned it earlier, standardisation and recording analysis and reporting. This, is, this was emphatically not one size fits all, but it was a plea if we're recording a certain kind of artifact in one place and using a certain volumetric approach, why aren't we doing it elsewhere so that we've got comparable results? These seem to be straightforward logical suggestions. And a lot of them came out of the Roman rural settlement uh, uh, work um, that was done um, a couple of years ago. Um, an underpinning with training and guidance, again, there's that standard and guidance, and also a, a request to find a way of enforcing timescales for reports. Again, not a one-size-fits-all, although I do know some countries in Europe that where it is exactly that, um, but uh, a, a, an approach to say, for this site, that's a reasonable time frame, you haven't got any excuse, get on with it. Um, heritage data access, uh, well, the Heritage Information Access Strategy, look it up on the web if you want to know more about it. It's a cross-sector approach to trying to link contractor-delivered uh, uh, heritage data with local authorities' data, with museums' data. It's an integrated, distributed system. If we get it right, it will be really brilliant. Um, so that's green. The OASIS backlogs will be considered as part of that. So hopefully we will get to a position where we don't, we're not chasing our tails. Um, and consider a database of active contracts and projects. Quite complex, probably goes into areas of confidentiality, maybe difficult to do, but interesting because it'll tell us what's going on right now as opposed to what went on a couple of years ago and it's finally made it to the archive or wherever. Um, improved research focus, promote more research-led investigation. Complete the next generation regional research frameworks. That's green because Dan Miles and his team at Historic England, along with large numbers of you, I think you've been involved in various workshops and so on, are developing what we hope to be the future of that, which will be a wiki-based uh, set of research frameworks. So it'll be dynamic and it'll be scalable. So it'll answer some of the questions that we heard before tea break about how do you make it fit and work to the, um, uh, the area that you're dealing with. Um, you can come back and, and make me eat my hat, but I think it will work. Um, and consider fully integrated regional hubs. Now, this one, I think, is quite a long shot, but it's a, it's a, a worthy um, approach, the idea being to bring together academics, managers, museums, uh, local um, uh, and, uh, community archaeologists, if I can put it like that, to create hubs, not just of research interest, which was the, the point of the research frameworks, but also of practice as well. Can we build something that, uh, that helps um, uh, commercial archaeology fit into a much wider local uh, engagement? And funding sources. Um, we were exhorted to produce guidance on funding opportunities for synthesis. So who's got money across the country and how do I get hold of it, please? Um, I haven't made that green, but perhaps I should have done, because there are funding digests, 
I just don't think they're necessarily written specifically for the heritage sector. So that's something that we could look at. Um, publication in a digital world, uh, audience and user needs, Steve mentioned it, the rapid review of the public user needs survey from 2003, I think it was, and that would be the public audiences and user needs survey, the pawns, um, and that's what we've been asked to do. Um, the next thing, I say we, that's the sector, not we in this her uh, historic England. Um, the next one's embracing digital, and I think Steve and Jan said enough about this already. That's the idea, the whole idea of, of, of the transformation of use and reuse and access to data and information, and possibly the death of the monograph, or at least its, its certain metamorphosis. Um, you collect once, use many <coughs> times, um, make sure it's free, make sure it's worldwide, and what's not to like. Um, and we're looking also, well, well, we've been asked to look at the status of hard copy monographs. They won't go away immediately, but there are people doing a lot of work, including uh, academic institutions such as JSTOR, um, on the future of the monograph, what it, how, it might, how it might work both digitally and in hard copy, and ensure a comprehensive accessibility of grey literature online. I've put that green because it connects up with the HIAS approach. We're also, Historic England is also continuing to fund uh, the deposition of grey literature reports into the Oasis Grey Lit Library, and we'll do so until we're con convinced, either till we run out of money or till we're convinced that there's enough going on that the, the system is stable without our intervention. Um, dissemination uh, addressed in the planning process. So again, policy, guidance and standards, but embedded in the WSIs, and I think Stuart mentioned something, or somebody mentioned something about that, in project designs and in cost structures. Appropriate charging for appropriate outputs to allow that uh, public access to the material. Um, and building skills, capacity and confidence. Um, investing training in publication. It's not something that people are automatically born with as a skill, um, particularly around uh, uh, editing and um, uh, the, the narrative approach. It's a skill you can hone and you can learn. Um, and establish communities or forums for publishers and editors, which is an interesting uh, proposal. Finally, uh, last but certainly not least, um, new models for archives. And as Steve mentioned, we are quite ahead of the game on this. Influencing and advocacy. We've been, Historic England have been engaging through a sector advisory body with DCMS and with the Arts Council England over the Mendoza uh, report, which specifically references the issues uh, around archaeological archiving. Um, and we are planning some kind of good practice or advocacy statement following the issue of whatever the Mendoza review action plan looks like. So that's still green as well. Gathering essential data, maintaining sites of skills capacity and storage capacity. We work with, we fund uh, the Society for Museum Archaeology to do their annual surveys and we're collecting information about um, uh, storage capacity. It's running out, skills uh, fading away. Um, uh, but we don't yet understand the use patterns of archaeological collections. I perhaps should have made that green because we're planning to do a bit of work on that. Um, and we haven't yet examined the visibility nationally of archives. Do people know what's, what's there? Do they, do they know how to find it? Um, strategic vision for storage capacity. Um, so this is a feasibility study for national and regional sustainable solutions. I am advised by DCMS that whilst it is PERDA, I am allowed to say that they are in the process of agreeing with Arts Council England a commission to undertake the feasibility study. So we've actually made some ground, and that's quite hot off the press, and I'm expecting a, the minister to write to the chief executive of Historic England to say that they're going to uh, hope would endorse the recommendations that we sent through. That's probably a once in a generation opportunity to try and solve this. So the sector is going to have to step up and play the game as well. Um, uh, ownership and title, reviewing the legal position on title and ownership. We've um, received some interesting legal advice uh, on this issue and it shows some interesting areas of promise which might 
resolve issues of long-term ownership in museum archives and backlog archives, and also maybe, maybe uh, take us to a place where model agreements for ta transfer of title are built into the process um, uh, from the outset of any archaeological excavation. So see if we can simplify it. Um, innovation in approaches to holdings, encouraging research into the approaches to selection and retention. We're going to be doing that. We want to see whether we can find ways of rationalising without losing the significance of archives, um, whether there are uh, opportunities to um, examine the digital potential for, um, if you like, digital proxies. Are there any ways in which we can store some parts of this, but not all of it? Um, so the sky's the limit, creativity is the game here, to see if we can find a way of reducing not the significance, but the size of these holdings so that they become sustainable, because that's the deal that might open the coffers to building a national and regional approach. Um, funding costs and charging, we are reviewing whole life costs of archiving. Uh, and unsurprisingly, perhaps, uh, the picture nationally is really complex. Okay, am I taking all the time? Up? Right, I'll just shut up. Um, <laughs> overarching recommendations. <laughs> These are the four, uh, uh, the top four here, leadership and advocacy, innovation, communication, skills and capacity that threaded through almost all of the, um, uh, the, the uh, workshops. Um, and these were the kinds of questions that we were being, or the, the challenges we were being posed. Right at the bottom is the biggest one in my view, the public value uh, issue. Define, explain, evaluate and demonstrate why the hell we do this. Sorry for taking up your time. Thank you very much, Mark.